And just like that, it's noon, isn't it? We'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Happy Tuesday. Thank you so much for joining us for a fun educational webinar on water smart tips and tricks for your landscape. My name is Rachel Bloom and I work with the CSU Alumni Association and I've partnered with CSU Extension in Wells County and I have Amy Lenz here with me today to bring this awesome program to you which we're super excited about. Um, a couple quick housekeeping things just in case you're maybe newer to a Zoom webinar format. Please feel free at any time to put anything in the chat that you'd like everyone to see. Just make sure you click all panelists and attendees as well as there will be hopefully some time at the end for Amy to go over some questions that you may have. So if you'd like to use the Q&A portion, that just helps us keep those questions outside the chat so they're a little bit easier to see. Um, you are automatically muted and we cannot see your video, so no worries there. If you're in the middle of eating lunch, we can't see you. And we're super glad we had about 60 people register for this event today. Many of those are members of the Alumni Association, so we absolutely thank you for your membership. And we have people from Colorado, I saw Albuquerque, so thank you to everyone who is joining us from near and far. We're really glad you're here. Um, I will be sending out the slides, and Amy has a lot of other great resources afterwards that she will mention. So if you're not catching quite everything right away, she'll definitely be a great resource and also has lots of resources to share with you. So I will also add to the chat some technology help uh, if you need it, as well as our alumni event calendar and the Weld County Extension website if you'd like to check out any of the awesome things that they're doing over there. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce you to our awesome CSU Extension agent, Amy Lentz. Amy is a Colorado State University Extension agent for horticulture, agriculture, and small acreage management in Weld County. And she works with residents and local farmers to address their questions and needs as they relate to land management, home horticulture, or crop production. And prior to working for Colorado State University, Amy worked as a research analyst for the University of Kentucky in the areas of fruit and vegetable research, cut flower production, nursery production, and seed testing. She also worked as a supervisor of horticultural farming operations at Moorhead State University in Eastern Kentucky, teaching students the fundamentals of horticulture production and greenhouse management. Amy holds a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resource Conservation and Management and a Master of Science in Plant and Soil Science Horticulture Nursery Production, both from the University of Kentucky. I think I think I did okay with your awesome degrees there, Amy. It was working yeah, on you that now. Probably, yeah, we should just shorten that intro, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we are so excited. Amy's been in Colorado for four years and loves water smart landscaping. So Amy, thank you so much for being here today. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to you and add to that info in the chat. Thank you again. Yes, thank you for having me today. Um, this is kind of cool to be teaching a, a wide variety of people from all over what seems like that maybe the Southwest and all the way out to California, Idaho. Oh my gosh, this is great. So hopefully, I think that this, um, although this program is a little bit geared toward Colorado, I think that it will also work well in California, anywhere um, or, or uh, New Mexico, anywhere where you're having water shortages or just really want to keep water in mind. Um, I am going to go ahead and turn off my camera just so that um, we can all concentrate on the screen here. So in today's class, we're going to cover a lot of different things about um, tips and tricks for your landscape to be more water smart. Um, general maintenance things we're going to talk about, like lawn watering. We're going to talk about some low water plants that you can choose um, for your gardens. And then also we'll talk a little bit about water harvesting, which is something new to Colorado. So let's see here. There we go. All right. So I always like to kind of open up with this um, funny meme that we hope you enjoy your stay at the Four Seasons. <laughs> because in Colorado, you know that we can get all Four Seasons in, in just a matter of, I don't know, a day or two. <laughs> so it's definitely not easy to garden here. Um, there's a few different variables that we have to think about, um, such as low humidity. While this can be kind of a pro in that it causes, um, or it, it has less disease pressure for us here. Um, also, we have cooler, summers in the shade, we, we actually get that effect of the shade. 
There are some cons with low humidity in that everything dries out more quickly from your skin to your hair to your plants. And then also it's really dusty. Fluctuating temperatures. This one is actually, maybe this should be the first one on the list because this is actually the one thing that I think causes the most problems for us to grow plants in Colorado. It's really not uncommon for us to see a 30 to 50 degree temperature difference within a day. Um, just this past October, we had a few days here along the Northern Front Range up around Fort Collins where we had several days in the 80s, seven, high 70s, low 80s. And then within 24 hours, it dropped below freezing and into the teens. And we have seen our trees just really suffer from that. So those big swings in temperature are one of those, um, one of those things that I think has the most effect on our plants. Also, we have high pH soils here in Colorado. Um, that means they're alkaline, and that's just not typical of the rest of the United States. So plants like maple trees, azaleas, rhododendrons, um, things like blueberries, they just don't grow well in our Colorado soils. Wind is another factor that we have. This is pretty common all across Colorado, but especially if you're located kind of out on the plains or out in the country where you're not getting that um, wind break from other buildings and structures around you. So maybe less so of an issue if you're in an urban area. We have intense sunlight, which means that, um, you know, we wear sunscreen here in Colorado because um, we have higher incidences of things like skin cancer because of that intense sunlight. Um, our atmosphere is only 10 miles thick, and with us being a mile high already in elevation, we, it, it's almost like we lose some of that atmosphere to help filter out that sunlight. Um, depending on where you are in Colorado, we have a pretty short growing season, much shorter if you're up in the mountains or in the foothills. But this last point, lack of water, is what I really want to focus on today. So we're going to talk a lot about water, but just know that you've got all these other variables that are kind of working against you in Colorado. And this is, again, probably true for a lot of our other western states. So let's just talk a little bit about water. So Colorado is a semi-arid state. We get about eight to 15 inches of precipitation a year. It really depends on where you live in the state. Um, the average Colorado household uses almost 50% of its annual water supply to water its landscape. Um, this number is a little bit older. I think that this number is coming down. Um, we've been doing a lot of work over the past couple decades to really get people to start thinking more water smart. So hopefully that's, that's lowering. Um, you may be paying for that water, which uh, as city water, which is a, a pretty good cost. Um, even if you're paying an HOA due where you just get the water through like a non-potable water system, it's still really important for us to try to reduce that amount of water we're using on our landscapes. We have more people moving into Colorado. So as more people move in, we're gonna have more and more demand on our water supply. So definitely something to consider. And then finally, if you do have a good, well thought out, water smart landscape plan, you can actually reduce that outdoor water use by as much as 60%. So if you're using 50% of your water on your landscape and we can cut that in half, you're putting about, you're making an overall change of about 25% of your water use, which is great. So for those of you around the CSU campus, um, I mentioned that we get 8 to 15 inches of rain per year. Just to kind of give you an idea, up here, we get around 15 inches. The closer in you get to the foothills, so like in the Boulder area, you guys are going to be getting about 20 inches per year, but still not enough. So I'm actually from the eastern United States. I come from Kentucky, as um, Rachel mentioned, and every year we would get on average 45 inches of rain, <laughs> of, of annual rainfall or snowfall. Um, so very, very, very different. So another reason we should be water wise is we also live in this pretty urban environment for a lot of us, um, whether you're in Denver or you're in Fort Collins or you're out in Durango, um, even in those towns, you still have that little bit of an urban environment. Um, this picture here is from NASA. Uh, this was taken from the International Space Station and you can see just how little green space we have in our urban centers. Mainly, this is the Denver area again. Um, so just, again, something to think about. And I'm going to show you in this next slide um, kind of how this urban environment affects our water use on the back end. So here you can see this chart. And as we go from 
zero percent impervious surfaces like woods and meadows and then start covering up our ground with things like row crop agriculture or residential lots or even buildings in urban areas you can see that the amount of runoff increases and the amount of infiltration decreases so when you're looking at an urban and urban environment you have 85 percent of that surface being impervious only a half inch of that water being applied gets infiltrated into the soil. The rest of it goes off as runoff. So again, another reason we really should start to think about how can we reduce our water use so that we don't have as much runoff. And then I'll also talk today a little bit about other types of surfaces that you can use to help that water infiltrate better. So I wanna start out with lawns. Um, in our landscapes in Colorado, Almost all of us have lawns to water. Um, I will say this, I'm not opposed to lawns. Um, again, coming from the Eastern United States, that's just kind of an American thing that we've all gotten used to having is a lawn because of kids or pets. Um, there's, there are uses for the lawn. Um, could you take that lawn out and go completely to a non-lawn landscape? Absolutely. If that's um, something that you don't need a lawn for kids or pets, go for it. Um, I think that you can really reduce your water use. Um, because a lot of our water does go toward the turf, um, about 90% of all of our turf issues in Colorado stem from water use and irrigation use. So this can be anything from clogged heads, broken heads, tilted heads, um, simply not running the irrigation for the right amount of time. All of these things can waste water. So we wanna make sure that when we are watering our turf that we're doing it in a very smart way. So we always try to eliminate irrigation first. Whenever I get called out to a house that has brown spots on the lawn, about 90% of the time it's just an irrigation issue. So again, why be water wise? You do not wanna be this person. <laughs> so this person is, well, is way over watering this small patch of grass. First of all, the number of heads <laughs> in that small area is a lot. Um, so they're getting double coverage of that spot and then also running it for too long and it's just running off and actually over the curb as you can see in this picture. So um, let's not do this. Instead, let's look at some things that you can do to be smart. So the first thing you can do is water at the best time of day. And the most efficient time to water your lawn is when there's actually dew on the grass. So, and this is just an arbitrary number, 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. It could be 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. or 7 to 7, whatever your local um, city rules tell you. Um, people sometimes will say that it's not a good idea to water at night because of diseases. But remember in the beginning, I told you that we have pretty low humidity here in Colorado. And so, to water overnight usually doesn't affect us in the same way as if we were to be watering back east where it's very humid and that water just sticks around. As soon as that sun comes up, it starts to dry those plants out. So we don't have to worry about that as much. Um, if you are worried about that, just shift your watering time to be in the morning. Um, start it, you know, say around two or three in the morning and then it's finished by the time the sun comes up, depending on how many zones you have and how long you need to run it. So before we talk about all these tips, I want you to be able to recognize whether your lawn has too much water or not enough water. So when we're looking at not enough water, um, some things that you wanna look for, your lawn is not as green or it's not um, as dense. Maybe you have more weeds in your lawn because weeds are really good at tolerating drought. So crabgrass, bindweed, dandelions, those could be a sign that you don't have enough water on your lawn. The roots of those plants go much deeper than the roots of your turf. Um, stress tracking, so kind of, it, you can see that in the picture there on the left. Um, as you run your mower through your lawn, it just kind of breaks down the, the structure of the grass blade. And so it can look like it's, um, it, look, it might look like you're tracking disease, but it's actually just drought stress turf. Um, you might see some diseases like ascochyta leaf blight, um, dollar spot, these are things that we see with lawns that don't have enough water. And I know this sounds counterintuitive, like why are you talking about not enough water? <laughs> we don't wanna add more water, but actually you do the a healthy lawn is gonna be a much more drought tolerant lawn. So you might also see some um, insects that come in, especially if you have a severely um, dry lawn. And those would be things such as winter mites. And that's the picture there on the right. Um, 
usually once we start watering, a lot of these problems actually go away. So then you might, this, this, uh, excuse me, let's look at the other side of the coin here. You might be wondering about how much um, is too much water on your lawn. So you'll be looking for things like squishy turf, shallow roots, um, poor drought resistance. So if we have a few days of where you don't water that that grass just starts dying, that's not good drought resistance. Um, your grass should be able to get through some periods of drought and still come back. You might be getting more soil compaction because wet soil, when you stand on it, um, all of that air goes out and it compacts it down. Too much water on your lawn can lead to more fertilization being needed just because you're constantly leaching those nutrients out of the soil. You'll get things like more rapid thatch formation. You might see some insects such as grubs. Um, I know along the Northern Front Range and in the Denver area, we're looking at Japanese beetle grubs um, soon starting to emerge into those adult insects if they haven't already. Um, so they definitely favor a well-watered lawn. You might be seeing more weeds in a well-watered lawn, but that's a different set of weeds. Um, and then there are some diseases like necrotic ring spot. And then the big one, higher water bills. It's just definitely not something you want to have happen. Um, you can see in the picture on the left where people have walked through that turf and it looks like it's just not bouncing back. It's kind of squishy. And then on the right, um, that's just a picture of a, an area being watered. Um, one, it's in the middle of the day, um, which I just told you is not a good time to water your lawn. And then two, if you can see the street in front of it, just water pouring out over two lanes of traffic there. So definitely need to adjust the watering heads on those. So this is a picture just to show you, this is the easiest way for you to know if your lawn does not have enough water is just walk outside and look where your downspouts um, release water after a storm. And if you see a nice green patch around your downspout, then that just tells you right there that you need to add more water to your lawn. Also notice how thin the grass is in this picture around, on the other areas, not around the downspout. So I get this question a lot, um, how long do I water? And that's a really hard question to answer because it's really not that simple. Um, you can see here, there's a lot of different types of sprinkler heads and all of these are gonna vary in how long you run them um, because they all have different spray patterns and they all have different outputs in terms of like inches per hour. Um, the run times on this chart are approximate too, just so, so you know that. So when I get this question, how long do I, do I water? It could, it could vary between zone um, and it, it can definitely vary between lawn with, with all these different options. So let me break this down for you a little bit easier. Let's talk about the different types of sprinkler heads. So the first one I wanna mention are the pop-up and fixed spray heads. They just kind of pop up out of the ground and they spray a fan. Um, they don't rotate or anything. They're just spraying that whole area all at once. So they're applying a lot of water in a very short amount of time. Um, runoff is really common with these, especially if we have clay soils or if you're on a slope because they're just putting out so much water in such a short period of time that it just doesn't have time to percolate down into the soil. Um, they're the least expensive heads to install, but they're the most inefficient in terms of runoff and um, Um, so runoff with these is much reduced. You're going to have bigger droplet sizes. So if you're in a windy area, that water is not just going to blow out into the street as much. Um, and then they're also easy to replace. So if you have those pop-up spray types in the top picture, you can easily um, convert those over to stream rotors. Just stick with the same brand and, um, and, and just take one off and screw the other one in. Just know that you're going to have to adjust your watering times. A typical run time for these is kind of right there in the middle, 25 to 45 minutes, three days a week. Um, there's a better way for you to know how much to water though than using this time, um, this 10 to 20 minutes or 20 to 40 minutes. Instead, I wanna show you um, in a little bit how to measure that. But first, let's talk about um, a little bit more about how much we wanna be watering each week. So for your bluegrass lawns, which most of us along this northern front range or actually the whole front range of Colorado and even on the west slope most of us have bluegrass lawns. 
Um, sometimes we might have like a bluegrass ryegrass mix or a bluegrass ryegrass fine fescue mix. But regardless, this is pretty typical for any of those types of lawns. You need to adjust your watering throughout the year. So that's the big take home message from this slide. So notice that in May, we're watering maybe one day a week, uh, maybe two. But then by July and August, we're watering two to three times a week. We're upping the number of minutes that we're watering. And then we're backing off as we move into the fall. Um, this is probably the best way for you to save water is just adjust the amount of time and the amount of um, the number of days that you're watering per week. Um, a bluegrass lawn, typically this time of year, is going to need about an inch and a half of water per week. Um, if you have a very steep slope that's south facing, then you might be looking at upwards of two inches of water per week for that specific location. So if you can put that on its own zone, that would be ideal and help you also um, pinpoint things a little bit more, customize it and reduce your water use. So you have to consider what's normal as well. Um, I put quotes around that because we're in Colorado, so we never know like you might have a cool spell in August, you might have a warm spell in April. <laughs> um, just make sure that you're adjusting your watering um, during those times. Um, make sure you have good coverage. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you a bunch of slides in the next few um, about coverage. And then again, remember this all depends on that type of irrigation head that you have as to how long you're running these. So this is kind of a, um, a way for you to do a self irrigation audit. So it, you have to look kind of closely at this picture, but you can see little yellow cups. Um, there's 10 of them, I think maybe nine of them throughout that picture. Um, and you can see that they've placed them in areas where the grass is really green, and then also in areas where the grass is brown. And then they're just gonna run that zone, that whole section. Um, I like to do this for a set amount of time, like 10 minutes, 20 minutes or 30 minutes so that you can easily find out how many inches per hour of water you're going to get. So in looking at this, you can see that this lawn has some really pretty areas and then some brown areas. Um, before I get to that, I should mention that we, I, I am going to have Rachel send you guys this diagnosing um, brown spots in the lawn with an irrigation audit um, to kind of walk you through the steps of this process. But you might be asking yourself, okay, what's causing those brown spots? So um, see here, you've got a cup in the green and you've got a cup in the light brown and you might be saying, um, okay, after say 20 minutes, I measured those and there's 0.2 inches in the green cup and 0.1 inches in the cup that's in the brown area. And is that really a big deal because it's only a 10th of an inch? Absolutely, yes it is um, because as you extrapolate this out over time, that healthy turf is getting twice the water that that brown turf is receiving. Um, so over the course of a growing season, you can see where this would make a huge difference. So um, this is a way for you to waste water because you're watering, but you're not watering effectively and efficiently. So here's another picture for you. Um, you can see that big brown spot in the lawn um, typically, people would call me up and say, there's some kind of disease taking over my lawn, and I'd say, check your sprinkler heads, because you can see right here that this head is too low, and so it's just not getting over top of the grass around it and um, causing that skip in the irrigation. Here's another example of a head that's buried too low, and so really doing a great job of watering right around the irrigation head, but that water is not making it out into the landscape. Here's a few more pictures, again, um, of just those heads needing some adjustments. And this is simple stuff. Um, most of these heads, if they were, if they were installed anytime, you know, in the past few decades, um, they were put on flexible pipes. So you can just lift them up and shove a rock underneath if you need to. Um, the piping is going to be a little bit flexible. So, um, but you can see here, lots of issues. Um, some of these don't come up perfectly straight. Um, some of these are too low, some of these are broken, um, some of them maybe just the radius needs to be adjusted so they're not watering the parking lot or the sidewalk. So that's it for the irrigation heads. Um, I'm going to leave you with a couple more tips when it com comes to the lawn. Um, mowing height really can make a big difference. You want a really nice deep root system to your grass, to your turf. 
Um, and as you can see in this picture, the taller the turf, the bigger the root system. And so don't mow your uh, yard like green or tea. You instead want to mow your yard more like a lawn. So up toward the, the right-hand side of that picture there. Um, the deeper your roots grow, because you're allowing for more top growth, that's going to cause less heat and drought stress in the long run. You'll also have fewer weeds, fewer insects, fewer diseases, um, and then that reduced potential for fertilizer leaching and runoff because those roots help break that soil up, allowing water to actually percolate down better. Um, last tip for lawns is that if, you know, if this all really bothers you, that you're, you know, you really want to conserve water more than just adjusting your watering times or, um, or the like, you can actually think about using an alternative turf type. Um, in the upper left-hand picture there, that's where they've taken lawn out and put pavers in because it was a high traffic area. And then they filled in with, um, I believe that's um, either Turkish Veronica or Creeping Time. Um, the upper right picture, um, that is a buffalo grass lawn, which is a warm season grass. Um, so it's going to look a little bit dull in the spring and in the fall, like you can see in the picture here. But then in the summer, when it's really hot, that lawn's going to be nice and green. And then if you are around the CSU area, um, just south of campus in the town of Berthoud is Northern Water, and they actually have several low water turf demonstration plots um, where you can go and look at different types of turf grasses and see how they look in a lawn situation and if that's something that you would want to consider. All right, I want to touch briefly on water harvesting. So there are two different ways of harvesting water in your landscape. There's active and then there's passive. So first we're gonna talk about active water harvesting. So um, rain barrels is one way that you can harvest water from the sky and use it in your landscape. Um, Colorado actually just passed this in 2016 in August um, that you can now have up to two 55 gallon barrels, so a total of 110 gallons per residential building um, with no more than four units in it um, or a single family home. You would attach these to a downspout for collection from the rooftop and then you can put like a spigot or you can even set this up to a drip system where then it waters the surrounding landscape. Um, you have to use the water on the same property that it's collected from and it must be used outside. There's all kinds of rules and regs surrounding um, rain barrel water collection in Colorado just because of all the water right issues. Um, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna include the fact sheet um, after the class so that you can read up more on that. Cause it, it's, um, there's definitely a lot of ins and outs to this and I don't have time to cover it today. But they are a really great way, like I said, to harvest water and water those landscapes. Um, if you have 110 gallons of water, that's generally going to cover an area of about 180 square feet with an inch of water. Um, so I, I should say this, I don't like to think of these as a all or like this is your only source of watering your landscape beds because it just doesn't rain enough in Colorado for that to be um, to be effective and to be around when you need it. So I like to use this as a supplement to my irrigation. Um, on those days when that rain, that rain has fallen and you've got that barrel filled up, then you can just kind of use that water for that week instead of using your tap water or your, your other irrigation water. Um, another thing to mention is that rainwater is really great for your plants. It's softer, it's lower in salts, and it's unchlorinated. So um, sometimes you can even get a little bit of a nitrogen boost out of using rainwater as irrigation. So as far as water collection in a passive fashion. This is another thing that you can do in your landscape to help you make the most of what water does fall from the sky or does run out of your downspouts. So passive water collection is just diverting water over land to vegetated areas for immediate use. So we like to use this um, little slogan, slow it down, spread it out and sink it in. Um, and you can then integrate this into your landscape and plant around where this water flows. So there's different forms of these passive water collection um, systems. The first being swales, and this is just where it spreads it horizontally along these contours. The next picture I have here is for berms. Um, this is where you create little micro basins. So as the water flows down a slope 
or from your downspout that you can kind of um, divert that water into little pools. Um, maybe you're wanting to move that water away from a structure. And in that case, um, one way of passively diverting that water is through a French drain. Um, this is just a simple, um, what we call, um, oh, I've lost my train of thought. Drain tile is what they call this type of piping. Um, I don't know why they call it that because it's not really a tile, but it allows the water to soak into that pipe through those little holes and then run quickly through that big pipe to other areas. So if you're trying to get water away from, say, the back of your house, if the slope comes down towards your house, you would use this French drain to divert that water around your house. And then you might want to divert it into what we call a biofiltration garden. Um, Bioinfiltration gardens are just another term for rain gardens where you just diverted that water into a garden type or landscape type situation. So you can see in the picture on the lower right there, that is a huge rain garden built in what we call um, a detention basin that doesn't fill up with water, um, but periodically if there's like a major storm. Um, not something for a retention basin, that's one that holds water in it. So um, different type of system. But anyway, these bioinfiltration gardens are really not that difficult um, to create even on a home level, like a, a home landscape level. So if you're going to do this in your yard, a couple of tips. Um, one, avoid underground utilities. Please call 811 before you start digging around and moving a bunch of soil in your yard. Um, that's just going to help you out. Um, also, don't create these um, within 10 feet from your house because you don't want water soaking deeply right next to your foundation. You want to move it away from the house and then sink it in. And then also, if you have a septic system, make sure that you're staying off your septic system with these types of rain gardens because it can just mess with the, the flow of how a septic system works. A couple other things, don't place these directly under trees because our tree roots need um, air to breathe and we don't want to be, again, drawing a lot of water to them. Um, too steep of a slope, it's not gonna work out very well. Um, you can try it, but it's not ideal. And then also consider where that overflow is gonna go. If you create a rain garden, you're diverting all of your water, say into one corner of your yard, make sure that your neighbor um, isn't gonna get affected by that. So, so I actually did this um, at my house. We, we just purchased a new build house a couple years ago and there was no landscaping in the backyard. You can see it's just a big um, dirt uh, area. It used to be a cornfield. <laughs> uh, but you can see as the water flows out of those downspouts that it has a direction that it was already moving in. And so all I did was um, took those, that naturally occurring runoff drainage way and made that into my rain garden. Um, and so here you can see uh, just placing big rocks to kind of keep that water moving in the right direction because um, water will always take the path of least resistance. It'll, it'll go through the biggest pore spaces. So I just kind of kept that water moving the way it went. And then um, over time, I'll be planting all along this rain garden area. Here's a few more um, options and ideas for different types of passive rainwater collection systems. Um, you can really make these pretty artistic, pretty, um, uh, you can make them a focal point really in your landscape. Pretty interesting stuff. I did mention that I wanted to talk a little bit about other types of products that you could use to help water permeate or, or filter down into the soil as opposed to running off. And one way to do that is with permeable pavers. They're going to allow not only for infiltration of the rainwater, but they're also going to allow for evaporation from the ground so that your, your soil is going to be healthier. It's going to be able to breathe underneath of that permeable paver better. Um, these come in a lot of different styles and um, different uses for different styles. Um, you can see some where they even have openings for vegetation to grow in between, which is really cool. And then here are some more pictures of just other types of pavers. Um, you can actually use these on a large scale um, if you really want to um, reduce your runoff, use them as a driveway, um, maybe an area where you just park your extra vehicles or even just a small patio. Um, they're much more expensive than concrete, but, um, you know, that's just an investment that you might want to make. So I want to move on now to some tips and tricks for your landscape, your garden beds, and your trees. And I'm just going to briefly go through a few tips and then hopefully we'll have about 15 minutes to run through a bunch of different plants 
um, that are going to be really good low water use plants for Colorado. So the first thing I want to talk about is this concept of Xeriscape. Um, this is just basically water-wise design. So this term was actually coined by Colorado State University, um, the, Associated, whoops, the Associated Landscape Contractors of Colorado and Denver Water. Um, they came up with this term Xeriscape to just really mean landscaping with water conservation as your primary objective. And the root word of Xeriscape, that Xeros, is the Greek word for dry. So um, how do we landscape in a dry situation? So there are some steps that were created um, and they will help, and this is through this Colorado WaterWise group, and they will help walk you through how to convert your landscape over into a more xeriscape uh, type situation. Um, there's seven steps, plan ahead, improve your soil, um, which is not always necessary, limit turf areas. Um, so maybe we wanna just bring that lawn in a little bit. Maybe we don't need the lawn along the edges of our fence. What can we do to just reduce our turf? Um, irrigate efficiently, selecting appropriate plants, mulching, and maintenance. Um, I, I think you're also gonna get this PDF or a link to this PDF that will walk you through these steps in the follow-up email. Just to touch on a few of these, as far as irrigating efficiently, again, the easiest way for you to make, um, make some progress towards water savings is just to adjust irrigation. So for your grass, you might wanna think about using those lower volume, um, like I mentioned, those stream rotors that have the, the streams of water um, moving across the lawn at a low angle. You might want to use drip irrigation um, or just some low volume, uh, low angle spray or bubbler emitters around just your garden plantings. Um, and then also you might, just like with your lawn, you might wanna adjust your watering times monthly in order to meet those seasonal needs of your garden plants as well as any of your trees, as well as your lawn. Mulch is another thing that's mentioned in this whole Xeriscape design step-by-step um, -step plan because mulch is really great for water conservation. It can reduce your irrigation needs by as much as 50%. Um, it really keeps the, the water that's in the soil from evaporating to the air. Um, it also keeps the soil cool. Um, it keeps those temperatures nice and moderate underneath so your plants are happier as well. Helps inhibit weeds. No, none of us like to pull weeds, so that's always a bonus. Um, and then it protects your plants, improves the soil. It just does so many different things. Um, as you can see in this picture, there's lots of different mulch available. Um, some of this is organic, whether it's like bark, straw, grass clippings, or wood chips, or it can even be inorganic, like gravel. Um, even landscape fabric is kind of a form of mulch because it's covering over the soil surface and it's being put on the top of the soil surface and not being worked in. So even a, a nice landscape fabric can help. Um, I will just say this about landscape fabric. It's only good for, um, it's only good until the weed seeds start to fall on top of it and then it's no longer helping for weed control. But, um, you know, that's up to you if you wanna use it or not. I'm not gonna um, say one way or the other whether you should or shouldn't. So a little bit more on mulch. Um, you can apply this any time of the year. In fact, I just applied a few more bags to my garden area a couple weeks ago because I noticed it was a little thin. Um, with organic mulch, just go three to four inches deep. And with inorganic mulch, just one to two inches deep. You really don't need a lot more than that. When you are mulching around your trees, this is very important. Pull the mulch back away from the trunk of the tree. Um, don't do what's in that lower picture. I don't think I have a big X over it, but I probably should. Um, so pull it away from the base of your trunk so that that tree can breathe because there are some gas exchange points where the trunk meets the ground and you don't wanna cover those over with a thick mulch layer. Um, don't ever use plastic under your mulch. I mentioned landscape fabric, that's okay but not plastic, because then your soil can't breathe at all and you'll start to get an anaerobic environment. Um, and then landscape fabric, as I mentioned, just ineffective over time. We do have a good CSU fact sheet called Mulches for the Home Grounds that you can look up more information on all these different types of mulches. All right, um, two more points to make in terms of tips for your garden and your landscaped areas. Um, with your trees, we want to make sure our trees are very healthy. Um, that's going to help them get through these periods in the summer where it's warmer and with less water and, and drier. 
And one way for you to keep your trees healthy is to care for them over the winter through winter watering. So when we have these prolonged day or prolonged periods of dry fall or dry winter weather um, in January, if you're going out without your coat on, um, there's a good bet that you probably should get out there and water your trees. Um, when the air is above 40 degrees and there's no snow cover, um, this can really help your trees in the long run. It's just going to, again, help them stay healthy so that down the road when it does get hot and dry in the summer that they can withstand that and not be stressed out from, from lack of water in the wintertime. And then finally, um, and we're going to spend the next um, maybe 15 minutes on this section, is plants. The, the Proper plant choice can have a huge effect on your water savings. So there was a study done in 2002 um, in Colorado Springs that compared water use of traditional landscape plants with those that are xeric or dry in nature. Um, and what they found was that water savings really ranged anywhere from 15 to 63 um, percent. If they were using natives in that landscape, um, they often performed very well under those xeric conditions. Um, and in this picture here, you can actually see three natives, maybe four. Um, the yellow flower in the front is a blanket flower, uh, Gillardia, which is a Colorado native. Behind that, the, the purple bluish uh, spikes, those are Rocky Mountain Pinstamins. And then behind that, there's a kind of a sagey green looking um, bush. That's a rabbit brush, also a native to Colorado. So natives are great. Um, they typically take fewer resources and probably the biggest benefit of those is it's supporting your local fauna. It's increasing biodiversity. It's helping things like our native bees. And we have in Colorado, we have over 800, almost 900 um, native bees and they prefer the native plants. So you don't have to use native plants. You can use plants from other sources as well. Um, Plant Select is a great program that was is um, through CSU and Denver Botanic Gardens where they uh, trial and then put forth new plants every year that are um, supposed to be tough, really tough plants, and, and they are. Um, they're not necessarily native. Some of these are sourced from around the world, maybe um, in the um, Patagonia area, maybe in um, Asia where they have a similar cli uh, climate to us. But those are all going to be uh, research tested and good performers. Um, they have a whole list at plantselect.org. Uh, resource Central, another great, um, another great resource for you to get good low water plants through their program that's called Garden in a Box, um, where they sell kits or flats of a group of plants that you can then put into your yard. Um, they actually have an August Garden in a Box coming out, like a fall series of boxes that you can purchase. Um, so you can go to their website, resourcecentral.org, and find those. Um, those are up now. Colorado Native Plant Society, a great resource for all of those native garden plants. And then they also have guides on their website that will pinpoint your area in Colorado and what's native to your specific area. And then CSU um, Extension, we have a huge long list of all kinds of different fact sheets that can help you ranging from lawn care, tree care, what plants to choose, you name it. Um, you can find that on our Yard and Garden website. And then I just want to, the last thing I want to mention is um, the picture here that you see is of a demonstration garden in Windsor. Um, there's a lot of these demonstration gardens across the state. Um, this is a great social distancing COVID-19 era activity for you to do um, where you can actually get out there and enjoy some sun and socially distance and then look at plants um, just could be a great activity for you. Plantselect.org has a, a list of all those demonstration gardens. They actually have a map to show you where a lot of them are at. All right, let's talk plant selection. I'm going to breeze through these next few slides. I'm not going to spend too much time on each plant, but I just want to give you a taste of water-wise plants and what can work well in your landscape. Um, just specifically in this picture right here, um, all of these plants that you're seeing are water wise and they are beautiful and they have a lot of color and a lot of life for the landscape. So let's start out with some deciduous trees. Um, the first one I want to mention is Kentucky coffee tree. 
Um, you can actually get a male form of this tree that doesn't have the bean pods like you see in the upper right hand picture. But this is a nice mature, um, mature size of 50 feet to 40 feet um, shade tree, nice big wide crown on it, um, nice dappled shade because of the small leaf sizes. Also has nice fall color being a nice yellow. Um, it does have a kind of a slow growth rate. It goes through kind of this awkward teenage phase where it might have just a few branches on it, but give it some time. Um, as it grows, it really has a nice, beautiful open crown to it. Um, full sun, very adaptable to a lot of different soil conditions and a very low soil moisture is necessary for this one. Russian hawthorn is a good small deciduous tree for your landscape. Um, just getting to a mature height of maybe, um, it says 20 to, by 15, but it's probably only gonna get up to about 15 feet um, here in Colorado. It's uh, tree shape is more of a, a wide spreading crown on a short trunk. Um, this one has a medium growth rate, again, very low soil moisture requirements. Um, and this one can be planted in either full sun or part shade. It has nice berries that, um, that the, the birds love in the fall, good fall color, and then, you know, there's a little bit of a story behind this Russian hawthorn in that um, they were kind of raising a group of these up at the Cheyenne Research Station before it went out of business um, back in the uh, probably like 1980s. And when it did go out of business or quit, quit being run, they left these and 20 years later they were thriving and looking great and they had no care whatsoever. So um, a really good tough tree for our climate. So again, I'm just going to mention a few of these. Um, let's look at a couple evergreen trees. Pinion pine. This is a nice native pine to Colorado. You can see the upper right hand picture is in its native habitat. And then the other two pictures is where it's been planted out in the landscape. Um, one thing I want you to notice though is that the, the grass has been pulled away from this tree, the one um, on the left there at UNC. That's in Greeley. Um, but they pulled the grass back because they don't want to be overwatering this tree because it's a low moisture requirement tree. So they've adjusted the lawn and they've adjusted the irrigation around it to not be watering in that area. Um, so not suited for a frequently watered lawn at all. Um, these aren't very big um, evergreen trees, only 20 feet tall, um, pretty slow growth rate too. So it'll take you a little, a little time to get there, um, but, a, but a nice tree. Um, very similar to that one is the bristlecone pine, another Colorado native. Um, this one grows all the way up to 11,000 feet. So if, if you're joining us from Leadville, go ahead and plant yourself some bristlecone pines. Um, they do have these little white resin dots on the needle that oftentimes we get calls on saying, oh, it's got insects or it's got scale. Those are just a normal um, resin deposit on the needle. Um, but very tolerant and um, definitely not one to overwater. Full sun is great. Um, this one will work in rock gardens because again, it grows really slowly. Um, and another fun story attached to this plant is that the oldest tree in the world, the lower right-hand picture there is Methuselah, which is a bristlecone pine in California. And we don't know exactly where it's at because they don't want people to go visit it and destroy it. So, um, but just know bristlecone pines, very long lived trees. And then finally, with your evergreens, the junipers, um, Rocky Mountain juniper. Um, there's tons of other landscape type junipers like the Woodward columnar juniper or Wichita blue juniper. There's a lot of junipers out there. Um, some people don't like the smell of them or they just, they're just not into them. That's totally fine. That's, you know, that's your preference. I like them. Um, I've grown to like them more since I moved to Colorado just because um, I tend to like things that work well and don't get a lot of problems and, and juniper is one of those. As far as deciduous shrubs, um, one to mention is the skunk bush sumac. This is a native shrub, um, grows anywhere up to 9,000 feet in Colorado. It's got really nice orange or red fall color, um, very clean looking um, architectural leaf structure to it and it even has a little bit of flowering in the spring. Another good deciduous shrub is the Pawnee Butte Sand Cherry. This one's also a Colorado native. Um, kind of more of a shrubby ground cover. Um, very drought tolerant. I have three of these in my yard. Um, I watered them the first year to get them established, which is true with all of these low water plants. You need to water them the first year to get them, get them rooted in. 
I have not watered those at all this year. Um, and here we are in the middle of July and it's hot outside and I still haven't watered my Pawnee Butte sand cherries and they look fantastic. Um, they do get about two feet tall, but six feet wide. So give them plenty of room, um, good fall color. Um, and then also these have nice flowers in the spring as well. Rabbit brush. So this is a native. Um, and this is the one that we're used to seeing along the interstate as we drive up and down I-25. <laughs> um, it's, it's definitely a native and it, it grows all over this front range area. Um, but there are some cultivars available, one called yellow twig. And then the one that is my favorite is the baby blue. Um, that's in the lower uh, left-hand picture there. You can see the baby blue kind of just creeping over a curb there, um, much smaller in size. Um, these flower in late summer with these nice yellow flowers, and I will say the bees and the butterflies are just everywhere on these plants, and lots of diversity when it comes to insects visiting these flowers. Um, also, it tends to be deer resistant. And then a few more of these deciduous shrubs. Um, Blue Mist Spirea has a really nice, pretty color. Um, this one will also be buzzing with bees. Um, if you're looking for a more hedge type, um, low water use shrub, Ch uh, Cheyenne Privet would be one to try. Can take pretty low water um, requirements. And then if you're looking for something that's kind of like a small shrubby tree, uh, maybe the Wayfaring Tree Viburnum, also a low water shrub. A few evergreens um, to choose for your landscape palette would be, again, with the junipers. Um, there are, again, tons and tons of different junipers. Um, especially in this shrub area. There's a few trees, but there's a lot of juniper shrubs out there. Very drought tolerant. Um, here's a few just to kind of uh, get you started. Broadmoor is a dense mounding dark green form. Acadia is a bright green foliage type that's kind of flat across the top. And then the Fitzuriana compacta is a silver blue one with very widespreading um, habit to it but there's like blue rug juniper blue star juniper i mean you name it there's the taller bigger fitzeriana types um, that are more of a foundation type um, evergreen shrub but they're great um, one thing i'll say about junipers they don't like to be pruned um, you can prune the dead out of them but if you're trying to cut them back from a walkway you're going to end up with a big dead spot so they don't like to be pruned so give them plenty of room wherever you plant them Another evergreen shrub, this one's a broadleaf evergreen shrub. It's called Oregon grape holly. Um, gets its name because the leaves kind of look like holly leaves and then it has these blue fruits on it in the late summer, um, early fall that look like grapes. Um, it's a broadleaf evergreen like I mentioned. Um, so a little bit different look for you. Also has these beautiful flowers in the spring and very tolerant of shade. So if you've got that shady spot, this is that spot that's always hard to find a plant for is the dry shade. And this is one that's really great for that niche. Um, let's see, fern bush or desert sweet. This is one of my favorite um, low water use shrubs. I just, I like the form of it. I like the way the flowers look on it. Um, it blooms a little bit later in the summer months, which is pretty cool um, because you don't normally see a lot of stuff blooming this time of year in the shrub area. Um, has nice cinnamon color stems, these fern-like leaves to it, um, and then a mature size, a very nice and tidy three to five feet tall and wide. It keeps a nice um, compact habit to it. Deer resistant, attractive to bees, all of those great features. And then finally, this is our last evergreen shrub. It's the Panchito manzanita, um, kind of another one of those low growing spreading shrubs. Um, and then, um, yeah, low maintenance pretty pink flowers on it um, in the early spring. All right, I'm gonna breeze through the perennials because we're running out of time. If you do need to leave at noon um, or at one, please feel free. Um, we'll, you'll have our contact info and you can always follow up with me if you have questions. Um, Pensamen, great um, perennial, um, lots of different varieties, great for sandy, low fertility soils. You don't need to amend your soils for these. Um, there are different types. Some bloom earlier, some bloom later, but all of them like full sun. There's lots of different types. Like I mentioned, 250 different types of penstemon out there. Not all of them grow well in Colorado, but a good number do. And this just shows you that range from the, the oranges into the pinks and the purples. Um, lots of variety. 
also known as beard tongue. So there's, there's these big three. There's penstemon, salvia, and hyssop. So um, next I want to cover the salvias. These are in the mint family. They're going to handle clayey soils as long as they're well drained. Um, they don't like to have their leaves get wet, so keep them on the dry side. Um, these tend to be deer resistant. And again, lots of different types, lots of different colors. This one here is Mojave sage, but then here is reds, blues, um, the silver sage having the white bloom, um, just a lot of different options there. And then this third perennial is the hyssop or agastache or agastache. There's so many different ways to say it. These also like a sandier soil, but these are blooming later into the summer. So with these three, with penstemon, salvia, and the hyssops, if you plant a variety of these, you should be seeing blooms throughout the entire season. Um, these also tend to be deer resistant and again, attracted to lots of different, um, lots of different critters. And again, variety. So you just saw Coronado. Here's a pink one, that's Sonoran Sunset. There's a blue one called Blue Hyssop. Um, so with these three, you can really make a pretty big impact and have all good low water plants. Um, here's even more of those hyssops, more blues, more pinks. I love the Apache Sunset, it's one of my favorites. Um, if you're looking for more of like that ground cover type blooming plant, ice plant is fantastic. Um, just like the ones I just mentioned, there's lots of different varieties here. Very short, only six to 12 inches in height, but they can spread three feet. Um, here's some pictures of different types, like the Allen's apricot is the upper um, left, lower left is fire spinner. We have some yellow ice plant, that's kind of the standard one, the hardy yellow ice plant. And then there's a raspberry granita at the bottom on the right there. Just a few more ground covers that you can add in would be, um, I'll mention in the picture here is red creeping thyme. Um, these are great between pavers and they actually get a nice little red bloom on them early spring. Uh, woolly thyme, very similar to the red creeping thyme, not really as much of a, a show in terms of bloom, but um, will fill in nicely between pavers. And then also Turkish Veronica. I have several of these. I use them um, kind of off to the sides of my walkways. They're not between my pavers, but beautiful plants, very low water. A few ornamental grasses for you. Um, this is why ornamental grasses are so drought tolerant. If you notice in this picture on the left, the turf grass, the roots are only four inches um, deep. But look at the root systems of all the rest of these grasses. They just go down, they go down feet. Um, some of them as deep as 15 feet, which is just crazy. Um, so they're really drought tolerant. Little blue stem is a great one. Um, has nice um, two to three foot tall habit, fluffy white seed plumes. The great thing about little blue stem is good in clay soils. Um, Blonde Ambition Blue Grandma Grass, another good choice. Um, kind of a compact grass, only three feet tall maybe and wide. And then Switchgrass, if you're looking for something a little bit taller, this one can get up to be five feet tall. And it also has a lot of variety um, and some good fall color to it as well. And then here are all the different um, cultivars of Switchgrass that you can get. The one in the picture there is Northwind. And then don't forget about the succulents. Um, we think of our, our dry xeric gardens as cacti and succulents. Well, there is a place for them as well. Um, add in those yuccas, hens and chicks. I love the Perry's agave. It's just got such a nice architectural form to it. Um, be careful around kids and pets. And then finally, um, there are some annuals that you can get to plant in your baskets or in your containers or just in your garden bed that are gonna be very low water. Um, globe amaranth is a beautiful one. It, this is a dry flower, so you can cut it and dry it, and it'll keep its color for years um, dried. Um, oh, there's some pictures of the globe amaranth um, as a wreath in, in a dry bouquet. Black-eyed Susans, these are the annual types. There's tons of these available. Um, great for cut flowers, too, so you can bring them inside and make a nice little vase on your table. Uh, lots of different types, different colors. You can have a lot of fun with these. And then Lantana, um, another good one that blooms all summer long. Oh, I thought I had another picture of that one. It has these little, um, they almost look like little miniature bouquets of blooms. In the reds, yellows, um, and oranges. And then zinnias, um, kind of that traditional garden annual. Um, 
but very low water, only an inch or half inch of water per week. And then finally, straw flower, um, another good dry cut flower, and also needing only a half inch to an inch of water per week. So lots of good choices for your garden, whether it's perennials, annuals, trees, shrubs, you name it. Um, there are a ton of plants out there. So when I send, um, when we do the follow-up email, um, there's several lists of xeric plants for you and they're separated out, trees and shrubs, perennials, annuals, etc. All right, do we have time for any questions? I know I ran right up to the last second there. Thank you so much, Amy. I, it looks like we just have two quick questions in the Q&A. Sure. Um, one person asked, how often and how much water for dog tough grass? They have pop-up spray heads, which they planted in 2016, which has done very well, but this year it seems to have a problem with dead spots, which is spreading. It's in a lot of sun. Okay. Um, dog tough is, is an interesting grass. It's actually a Bermuda grass. Um, it's very, it's pretty low water use. Um, I'm not sure what would be causing the dead spots, um, but it does run. As far as water per week though, I, I would have to look that up and I'll see if I can find it really quick. Um, was there a second part to that question? It looked to me like that was the main question, was just kind of curious about the water and I guess then why there might be some dead spots this year. Yeah. So that's going to be one of those things I think you're going to have, if they're in Colorado and, and actually if they're anywhere, they should probably send some pictures in this description um, to their master gardeners um, that are in their county. Awesome. They all um, usually operate help desks and can help you diagnose what's going on through some pictures and things like that. Um, still looking for that water requirement on this. But yeah, check with your local master gardeners because they might be, um, they'll just have more time to look deeper into this question because that's a, that's a tough one. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. And yes, Lisa, thanks for submitting that question. Please feel free to contact your local master gardener. Or if you're in Colorado, feel free to contact me and I'm happy to send you over to which extension office to Ooh, connect great. with. That's great. Um, thanks, Rachel. Absolutely. My pleasure. I use extension all the time for all of my questions as well. So I understand what a great resource you all are. Oh, I just found it. Um, I just found an article that says it only needs a half inch of water per week, which seems pretty low. So um, yeah, anyway. Awesome. <laughs> all right. One last question for you, Amy. Uh, someone asked if rabbit brush is invasive. Is rabbit brush invasive? Um, it's it's a native. It's I wouldn't say it's invasive. It might be considered a little um, aggressive. I guess it can recede. It can kind of show up in places where you weren't expecting it. Um, and I would say less so with the cultivar types. Um, we have about ten rabbit brush. Actually, that right there is rabbit <laughs> brush <laughs> in my um, in my picture there and. Um, we have about 10 of these planted and I haven't seen this spread. It's been two years and I haven't seen any new ones pop up anywhere, but it's a cultivar type. It's been bred a little bit differently. Um, you might see, yeah, you might see some rabbit brush move around, um, but again, it's a native. So it's not like it's um, invasive to our landscape. It's not going to out or, or displace something else. Might be invasive for your, your awesome. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Amy. Everyone, thank yeah. you for joining us. And uh, we will be sending out all of those amazing resources that Amy put together for you all. Obviously, as you can see, there's so much out there and there's so many amazing opportunities for having a more water smart landscape, yeah. whether that be your trees, shrubs, or plants. Mm -hmm. So I know myself, I'm inspired for yeah. my lawn in that new way. But thank you again so much, Amy, for your time You're today. Welcome. Absolutely. Great. Have a great day. All right, everyone. Yeah, take care and go Rams.